I am really excited to have uh, panelists from all stakeholders in our community here that I think can help us begin a positive discussion and the creation of a framework that can make an appreciable difference in Tuscaloosa. I want to give you an overview of the Department of Corrections and then I'll turn it over uh, to Mr. Steve Watson who oversees the supervised uh, reentry program and then I'll turn it over to Carl Byers who oversees the Community Corrections Program. Our mission is to confine felons and at the same time ensure that the inmates and our staff are safe and secure and in a humane environment. And Commissioner Dunn has established three values that we're going to focus on within the Alabama Department of Corrections. That's professionalism, integrity, and accountability. Within our department, we do have special services for our inmates to include our veterans. Can we reach the almost 25,000 inmates in our state prisons with our rehabilitative and vocational programs? The answer to that is no, because those services and programs that we do provide to our inmates is driven by funding and manpower and other resources. We have 28 prisons within the Alabama Department of Corrections. We have 16 major facilities, 12 work release community work centers. We haven't built a prison in the state of Alabama for 17 years. The newest prison is our Bibb County prison, built in 1998. Our general fund, fund appropriation of fiscal year 2015 was approximately, well, it was $394.3 million. We're the second largest funded state agency in the state of Alabama behind Medicaid. And it's because of our, the conditions of our prisons. They're old. It costs more money to keep our prisons updated and operational and plus the overcrowding issue that we have within our prison system. We have approximately 3,900 employees with close to 25,000 inmates. Our correctional staff, we have 4,214, total assigned 2,904, which is 68.9%. Now, when we address the correctional staff, we're including the supervisors, and the correctional officers that are on the front lines within our prison system. If you just look at our correctional officers, we're at approximately 58%. The national standard for inmate to correctional officer ratio is five to one. In our prisons, we average inmate to correctional officer ratio eight to one, and we're much higher than eight to one in a lot of our facilities. On May the 19th, we had our first graduation class at the, at the Alabama Corrections Academy. We graduated 107 correctional officers. That was my first graduation ceremony I attended. And I can say that I was very proud to see the young <coughs> men and women who are holding up their right hand, taking an oath to serve the state of Alabama in our state prisons. 15% of that graduation class were female correctional officers. In 2009, that percentage was 4.7. So we're seeing an increase in, in the female correctional officer population within the prison system. If we keep on track, we will increase our recruiting force, our new correctional officer force this year by 30%, which is good news for our department. Prison overcrowding isn't unique to Alabama. We live here in the state, we realize it's an issue, but it's a national issue. We've seen federal receivership take place in California. Their prison population was at approximately 200% at the time. They were forced to take certain actions to release inmates back into society, maybe before they should have been released, and it cost additional, um, and, and it was costly to the state of Alabama, I mean California. 
According to the ACLU, the U.S. prison population has increased 700 percent since 1970. We've already talked about why. Uh, the Habitual Offender Act and, and other um, uh, penalties that, that are imposed. One in 99 adults living behind bars and one in 33 adults are under some form of correctional control in county jails or probation, parole, etc. Here is our current prison capacity. We have close, medium, and uh, ma um, excuse me, close, medium, and minimum uh, facilities within the prison system. Custody, we used to refer that uh, that level to maximum security. So in our custody level facilities, those are uh, the highest level um, security inmates that are housed there. When we talk about design capacity, if you looked at when the, the facilities were built, going back to Draper being the oldest, 1939, when that prison was first built, it was built to house a certain number of inmates. The same applies to other facilities. Over the years, we have added dormitories. We even have added trailers to help house the inmates in our facilities, but we have not improved the infrastructure within the facilities. Most facilities have double, double bunk dorm dormitories. We have close to 200 inmates in one dormitory that should only hold maybe 90 or 100. So when we talk about design capacity and overcrowding, we're, we're, we're referring back to the original design of that facility to house a certain number of inmates. We have seen a decrease in our inmate population by 1.6 percent over the last 12 months. Our current uh, percentage is 185.3 percent. How did we get there? Our prison construction has not kept up with the harsher penalties for offenders. From 1978 to 2015, the prison population has increased to 467 percent. I know the press reports 840 percent. I'm not going to debate the percentage. 467 percent is a significant increase. Look at the increase between 1998 and 2008. It over doubled. But our last prison was built in 1998. So we haven't kept up. Um, our construction has not kept up with the prison population. Our yearly average admissions, you see in 1985, 4,407 to 2014, 11,849. Here are the top five convictions. Uh, the chief can probably look at those percentages and say they probably are comparable to the convictions within the city. 65% of admissions are drug-related and theft, burglary, burglary, and robbery related. Here's where Tuscaloosa fits in to the total current population, 779 incarceration, incarcerated for the first time, 676 had previous incarcerations for a total of 1,455 out of the 31,764. In June of 2014, Governor Bentley launched the Justice Reinvestment Initiative. And out of that initiative, the Alabama Joint Prison Reform Task was formed, and some of you in the room today may be on that task force. The task force is mandated by law. Out of the uh, Prison Reform Task Force uh, grew SB 67, which Governor Bentley recently signed. The legislation provides for more supervision of those inmates who are released to invest initially $26 million in 2016 and more than $25 million annually between 2017 and 2021. We're adding, when we had a question about the number of uh, parole and probation officers, the numbers that we have the intent is to hire at least minimum 123 parole and probation officers. 
and to uh, include additional funding for substance treatment and recidivism reduction programs. Ba based on um, data that was provided by the uh, Council of State Governments during the process of determining what we need to do to the state of Alabama to help reduce the overcrowding issue. Based on that data, with the implementation of this legislation, we'll see a decrease of approximately 4,500 inmates, which would bring the current uh, percentage down to approximately 150 uh, percent. And I have seen a number that, in, in addition to the legislation and this funding, with an additional $60 million, we could add an additional 1,500 beds, which would bring the prison uh, percentage down to another uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent. And as it was addressed earlier, the legislation creates a Class D felony for certain offenses, alter, uh, alters crime levels for related offenses, and creates new offenses based on such uh, classifications. It also, defendants will receive a split sentence for Class C and D felonies of no more than two years confinement and no more than three years of probation. Improvements and opportunities, reentry services, recognizing the need for substance abuse treatment, job training, educational programs, vocational training, et cetera. Again, we provide vocational training to our inmates in 15 of our facilities. I said we have 28, but we offer those vocational programs in only 15, so we can't reach all 25,000 inmates before they're released. 95% of the inmates that are currently incarcerated will return back to our communities. So we're doing everything that we can to help rehabilitate the inmates through our reentry program at Limestone. We also, that's a 90-day program. We also have a, a two-week program and it's only two weeks, but we offer a two-week pre-release program at our other facilities. We only have 300 beds at Limestone, so we can't take all inmates into that re-entry program who will eventually be released. We talked about, or I heard during dis uh, the discussion this morning, about supervising or supervision of inmates who are released, and I agree. And, and Steve will talk about the, the, this in more detail. Supervision alone is not the answer. We have to take a holistic approach to helping reintegrate those inmates returning to our community. I believe it will take the support of our churches, focusing on the family. You have to look at homelessness, education, employment, and health uh, in regard to supporting those who are returning back to our communities. And diversion programs, we mentioned the Veterans Court program. It's been very successful in the state of Alabama. It continues to expand. And if we can identify those inmates or those individuals who may have mental health issues and, and divert them to the mental health uh, courts, again, that all adds together to help reducing our current issues with overcrowding in our prisons. This new bill, SB 67, it mandates that this prison reform committee will stay intact and continue to address issues within the state prison system. And Commissioner Dunn fully supports this initiative. Involve all levels of government, all three branches of government in this initiative because it affects the entire state of Alabama. It affects all communities within the state and fully fund SB 67 for increasing pre-release and post-release supervision programs. Uh, Mr. Watson, Mr. Byers will, will um, give an overview on the SRP and CCP program, but, but it's proven by, by the stats that these two programs alone have kept the prison uh, overcrowding below 200%. If our department receives a 5% reduction in the, in the general fund, we're going to have to close two major prison facilities in the state of Alabama, which will increase our prison population by approximately 5,000 inmates moving from those closed facilities into the other 20, uh, 26. 
If we don't receive at least $20 additional million dollars in this year's funding, we're probably going to have to discontinue leasing some of our beds in our county jails. We have lease agreements with 10 county jails throughout the state of Alabama. We have approximately 1,700 inmates in those lease beds. The budget for leasing those beds each year is approximately $9 million of our budget. So if we don't see an increase of at least $20 million to our current budget, then we may have to discontinue some of those lease beds in our county jails. If we don't receive at least a minimum level funding, we're going to have to probably do away with some of our drug treatment programs within our facilities. And again, we may see another increase because of the lack of providing those services, you're going to see the recidivism rate increase. Um, are there any questions before I turn it over to Steve Watson? Yeah, Mr. Horton, um, obviously when, you're, when, when the capacity is at 200 percent or 185 percent, that gets the attention of the federal government. Uh, what is this, if, if you know, what's that percentage of overcrowding that the federal government finds acceptable? When California went, I'll use California as an example, I believe that once they um, took the measures to reduce their overcrowding, I believe they went down to 140 percent. So I believe that would be probably a, a target percentage. And, and do you think that's reachable within a five-year period? Well, I don't know if anyone has an answer to whether or not the federal government would, would come in and take over our state prison system. Um, I believe this legislation that currently passed, it's not a cure-all solution, but, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, do we need to set a, set a goal or set a timeline? When do we need to reach this? I don't have an answer to that, but I think we all need to do just like, this summit today, the state of Alabama needs to continue working together to do everything that we can to reduce the overcrowding issues within our prisons and within our county jails and our, or in our city jails. And I was noticing the, uh, the counties that contribute uh, inmates and uh, Tuscaloosa has always been right about that level. Um, and three years ago, four years ago, when, we, when the sentencing commission came out with the voluntary sentencing guidelines, I looked at it and I thought, well, that in, in some ways that doesn't change the way I'm going to sentence somebody. We've been doing that pretty much here all along. You look at a, a one particular county ahead of us that it's le it's we're twice as big as they are, but they uh, contribute more than we do. Uh, so, I guess just a, as an observation, every day I feel like I compete with the Department of Corrections, and every day y'all probably feel like you compete with the circuit judges, and I, I get that, and I appreciate what y'all do. But we have the sentencing guidelines not because of Tuscaloosa. It's not because of Jefferson County. It's because of some of the smaller counties around the state that sentence them to whatever they want to sentence them to. And generally, it's really, really high sentences. So, I've, <clears throat> In the short time that I've been with the department, I, I've, I've noticed that there are some inconsistencies in the sentencing throughout the state of Alabama. When your county's number 12 and you're about five or six of well, the number of inmates you have that may be an indication. To speak a little bit more to the, um, the federal receivership, we should know. Alabama was under receivership from 1972 when Judge Johnson placed us under the order. Uh, Judge Varner uh, succeeded him when Judge Johnson went to the appellate court. But it's, it's more than just overcrowding. It's a function of overcrowding. But when Alabama was placed under receivership in the 70s, and we did not come out until 1989, Governor James was uh, um, took on being receiver, I believe, in 1980. And it was an embarrassing thing for our state not to be able to manage our own prison population. But we did see some, some strides forward. 
uh, number one, with an academy. Uh, there's a multitude of things, medical, mental health, uh, the conditions were deplorable. Uh, and, you know, it embarrassed me as a citizen. And, and this is not Montgomery coming here to talk to Tuscaloosa. Everything's local. Um, I graduated from Tuscaloosa County High School. My whole family lives in Coker and Northport. Uh, I applaud uh, Mayor Maddox and the rest of you for coming together because this is the way you come about solutions. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of these on such a scale. We've done some things in Birmingham, but I applaud uh, all of you for being able to come together to talk about these things. It's very complicated. And, and I started out as a line correctional officer. I'm going to start my 29th year um, next month, July 1st. I've been a warden at five different institutions. I've been all over the state. I've dealt with the folks that you're talking about, the worst of the worst. M most of my time was spent at Kilby. Uh, and I've been there. I've talked with these folks. I've intermingled. I've ran our prisons. I've s seen the issues that we have. One of the things that we did is similar to this on a different scale. Uh, Commissioner Allen, in 2007, we had 1,300 inmates in Louisiana. Uh, I know because I had to drive to Louisiana and monitor uh, our private bed contract with them. We were spending $15 million a year to send inmates to Louisiana because we couldn't handle our own inmates in Alabama. We were leasing beds from a private company there. Our tax money going straight out of the state. Uh, one of the things, we had a multi-pronged approach to address that. It was establishing what we refer to in this presentation as SRP, Supervised Reentry Program. And you're so right, supervision alone is not enough. What you have to have, you, you have to have supervision because if you don't, then there's no guidance whatsoever. Like I said, when we send them back, uh, inmates that have psychosis back to the community with 30 days of medication, you got 30 days in which to get them started back in anything from an antidepressant all the way to um, um, uh, antipsychotic. We, have, we don't control our clientele. We have to let them go on their end of sentence date. And SRP, that's what Commissioner Allen and the rest of us, there's about 20 of us that sit down in the room and did just this. We talked about it and hammered it out. We argued, and you're going to have arguments because nobody really wants to take on all of it, but you can't because it's so complex. You have to come up with the best solution that you can, and you have to use data-driven numbers to be able to channel your finite resources because all of our resources are finite. We only have about 13% of our entire 433 million that is um, income in which we can target where it goes to discretionary spending. The rest of it goes to power bills, salaries, health care. 115 million of that is medical contract. We all know how much the med medical contract costs for ourselves and the rising cost of that. We have an aging population, uh, more geriatric. Um, and as you see, as we go through there, and I'm going to go through this very, very quickly, what we did in that room, and it was a multidisciplinary approach like we have here, we sit there and we talked about the biggest issues to overcome. Why are these inmates coming back? We have about 40% of them uh, on average, depending on which facilities they leave from, that do between 31 and 40% that do come back. Always be careful when you hear the term recidivism. Watch the definition. Our definitions are the same all the way across. It's return to prison within three years. SRP and the way we've done it is we've used low caseload ratios, intensive supervision, and a targeted all the things that we think that inmates come back to prison for. And our recidivism rate, and it's not my numbers, it's um, on the same scale, is less than 20%. Uh, and the cost of operating that program is about half the cost of incarceration. Uh, the inmates are not covered under our medical contract when they go out. The, but our supervision that we have in the field, which Senate Bill 67 talks about the supervision aspect of it, you do have to have that, but that's not all you have to have. You've got to have somebody that can target it, and it has to be effective supervision. Uh, supervision alone is not enough. Uh, our friends with pardon and parole, um, 190 to 1 caseload ratio, come on. You cannot, all you're doing at that point 
And, and, and I, I'm not throwing off on them. That's just the sheer numbers that they're supervising because they, they supervise that entire state probation and parole caseload. They do a good job as much as they can, but if you have 190 inmates in reporting once a month, you know, those numbers, they have some programs in which they would target higher risk offenders, particularly in Jefferson County. I'm not sure if they did it in Tuscaloosa or not, but you have to channel your resources. Hiring another, Senate Bill 67 called for hiring 101 new probation officers, state probation, and I think 24 clerical. That will give some help to them because I think their total is around 500 anyway. But you have to have effective supervision. And what we do, you know what the statute calls for us to give the inmates upon EOS? And like I said, we don't control our clientele. When the end of sentence comes, we send them back to the county they were sentenced from, $10 in a bus ticket. And if you let most, if you put most of us out, we're going to struggle with $10 in a bus ticket. You know what they're going to do if they don't have a family support system or, or a friend support system. They're going to go right back to crime to survive. Uh, $10 in a bus ticket is not going to get you very far. A work release program is half that we established in 73. As a work release warden at one point, I saw an inmate go out with $20,000 that he had earned while he was at work release. State peels off 40% of that to pay for their incarceration, but the work release program does help them have that cushion in their pocket. Because if you look at it and you drill down and you see who are these people that's coming back to prison, what you see is people that have burnt their bridges while they were out. They victimized their own family members through their own substance abuse and their addictions, et cetera, and, and their friend base. They're not welcome in, even in their own homes a lot of times. One of the biggest issues we have is where do they go? Where do we place them? You know, we have to use transitional housing for half of the inmates on SRP because they do not have a sponsor that we feel like is suitable to, for the inmate to be successful. To keep that recidivism rate under 20%, you have to have a sponsor that's able to pick up the phone and call. You have to have effective supervision. Every day, we've got 32,000 inmates, but do you know how many, and that's in the jurisdictional population, about 25,000 in-house. Do you know how many of that 32,000 is going to be on the streets in one year? 11,000. Um, from um, You spoke to it earlier in your presentation, that turnover, I think you said you processed 12,000. That's amazing. That's amazing at the folks that come through. And think about the disruption in all the lives around them. But a third of our population is going to be on the streets in one year. 95% of all of our inmates are coming back, even with a life without paroles that we have at St. Clair, Donaldson, Kilby, and um, uh, Tutwiler. The things that we did uh, is our caseloads are between 20 and 50. Uh, we and, and I hired aggressive, high-performance uh, people. I handpicked my staff. And we do it, we operate it all over the state. We've placed 8,500 inmates thus far since 2007. So we've had enough time now to gauge and, and place a barometer on, on the successes of it. They see each other face to face at least once per week. It's more than that, but we require once per week. They talk to them every single night on the telephone. If the, inmate, if the family doesn't have a land-based telephone, they can't go. Uh, they have to talk to them every night. They have to look at them once per week because what they're looking for are subtle changes and uh, reverting back to addictions, et cetera. Not shaving, uh, let me see your pay stubs, let me make sure, you know, you have to, ha you can't coddle these folks. The, uh, of course, we cannot place inmates in federal housing. It's against the law. They wouldn't allow that. But, there, but for those, um, typically, well, on males, we can place those inmates under statute up to a year prior to the end of sentence. Females will place up to 18 months. Now, typically, uh, it's more close, it's closely aligned to six months. We've had some inmates that's been in prison for 20 years you know, um, that the last few months, we want some supervision over them. If not, they're coming back out without any transition whatsoever. Of course, prisons tend to be a little longer stay than uh, county jail because of the, the function. We have no sex offenders that we will place on the program. The, uh, and we do place violent offenders, uh, those that have violent convictions, because they're coming back anyway. 
uh, if they have a homicide or a uh, are serving on a current escape or, or what we term as a restricted offender, we will only place them if they're three months out from their EOS date. Not a parole review date. This is a hard EOS date. These folks are fixing to come back. So what we want to do is be up in their face with our top supervision, uh, go and visit that home plan. We run NCIC, we run them through LETS, we run through Alicop, just like we do, the, I'm talking about sponsors. And then we do the same with the inmate twice per week to make sure through, across those entities that they're not getting, it's not something happening that we don't know about. If there's any other database that can reveal that to us, we'll latch on to that. You know, we, want to, we, we try to be partners in that community. Our, our staff across the state, and I don't have that many of them, but they become involved with the local climate, the local police, the local sheriff's office, everybody. Sponsor can be uh, either an immediate family member, uh, that would include an aunt or an uncle, because typically what we've seen as we looked at it, most everybody has an aunt or an uncle that is sat uh, satisfactory. A lot of times you see that cr uh, criminality is ran into families, mama, daddy, sister, brother have all served time, and we're not gonna put them out there under somebody that's under supervision themselves. No, we want a sponsor that we feel like can do this and that will pick up the phone, and they do, they do. Sanctions, you know, we can do any number of things. We don't have to have due process as far as returning them back to prison. We go get them, we take them back. They can be in Donaldson tomorrow when they're out in uh, Tuscaloosa today. Right now we have only five inmates in Tuscaloosa uh, that's on SRP. Uh, Sergeant Gary Bice, used, um, he's worked at the cattle ranch for many years, was former um, police chief down in Greensboro. Uh, works for our uh, supervised reentry program in that respect. He manages this caseload. Uh, but like I say, we keep a manageable caseload. We look at the things, we talk to them. Every person coming out of prison on SRP or any person coming out, of, they need different things. They're, you know, and, the, and that's what's the difficult part about it. You have to target those resources. If somebody has never done drugs and they're 60 years old, they had too many drinks and ran over somebody, <coughs> coming out, they may need this, whereas a common, everyday, what people refer to as druggy, uh, they may, may need this. So you target those resources and you use them wisely, but the main thing you've got to do is stay up in their face with that type of supervision. Uh, we're not looking for reasons to carry them back to prison. That's not what they're out there for. But these folks administer our stringent requirements and we see results on it. Like I say, we had to go to 2010 to get the first recidivism numbers, but it's sustained year after year. We're under 20% on it. And that's across our entire recidivism spectrum, which is between 31 and 40%, depending on which prisons uh, they were released from. Uh, any questions on SRP? We're limited on time. So. Has there been discussion about um, as far as the shuffling of funding that's going to have to happen within Department of Corrections, increasing your budget so that you can increase the number of officers, the number of resources that you have, and the number of programming that you have available, and the number of contacts within each community so that there's more devoted to that. I'll be quite honest with you as, as far as we are really, really hoping that we don't get that 5% cut. If, if we get that 5% cut, we're gonna need, let me tell you what it looks like as a correctional officer in, in a dormitory. When uh, uh, Bob spoke to our ratios, that's not real. Our ratios, here's what it's real. I'm second shift commander in 1991 at Kilby, and I've got one officer in a dorm of 250 inmates. That's real. I have uh, 1,200 inmates at Kilby, and I have 20 officers, and five of them are in towers. That's real. One officer, it's dormitory style. This is not escape from Alcatraz, where you're looking at everybody has their own little cell. That's not prison. We have some of those, but prison is open bay dormitories, big warehouse, and we can't just throw a, some uh, razor ribbon and chain link fencing up around a building and call it a prison. The infrastructure that Bob spoke to, you know, it's crumbling. We have a generator at Hamilton uh, we were talking about the other day, it was built in 1962. 1962. That is amazing. When you can't see your hand in front of your face and you got the worst of the worst, and I'm telling you, I have seen, I've looked into the eyes of them through 
through the cell bar because that's where I came from. You, it, it can be pretty daunting. When you've got cell doors that you can't lock, that can be pretty daunting. When the lights go out or, or there's a disturbance and the locks and the sock are coming, uh, uh, soap, a bar of soap and a sock. I've been there, done it. I've seen melees. And I also have also, I've never lost sight of the fact of, of having faith in the individual though. If you target things right, you can really turn it around. You'll never be able to eradicate it all the way, but you'll at least be able to do what we feel is our function, to do the best you can. Because when they come to us, many other systems have failed in the local community. Schools, family, uh, peers, everything. This is a group thing. It's not, you know, how good of a job we're doing or how good of a job they're doing at the sheriff's office or the police department. Yes, we can do a better job always, but this is a complex problem that it's not an easy fix. We just have to target our resources uh, the best we can. I'll tell you the truth, a lot of the inmates have a 70 beta score, uh, uh, IQ. Uh, 70 is uh, borderline mentally retarded. Uh, they have limited skills. They have other issues. They have addictions. They may have a mental illness at, at times. That happens a lot. It's tough to find employment and to help this person to continue to be successful, but we never stop. We target as much of those resources to address those needs. When my staff gets that, uh, that piece of paper uh, across their email and they look at it, we've already targeted issues that we see. I'm a board member uh, to where I select the inmates that do go, me and uh, about four other people, and we make those determinations but we address the needs that they have and they also are adept at being able, they've already determined and allocated resources in the community. Um, community Corrections it was uh, formed by the Community Punishment and Corrections Act uh, many years ago and it was revised in 2003 and primarily it's meant as an alternative to, for judges to sentence either prison or probation and Community Corrections provides that alternative. These are the goals that are, of Community Corrections that are uh, set out in the statute. And as you see through these, there's just, just to hit a few things, you know, trying to hold the offenders accountable in the county because the, it, community corrections is a county program it's to provide a safe and a, a most efficient uh, cost for housing an offender. Housing them in community corrections is far um, less expensive than in prison. Um, and one thing that's really important, the philosophy of holding offenders accountable in their own community. If they're in the community, they can pay restitution and they can have a possibility of supporting their, their families. Community Corrections started uh, many decades ago at, with a nonprofit corporation. Some of the local programs were formed by local legislation such as uh, Mobile, uh, some of the larger county programs, such as Jefferson County, has a long history of, with the UAB uh, task program. Community Corrections has grown uh, significantly just over the last decade. In 2004, we had 771 offenders that were participating in a local community corrections program in their county. And we had 23 programs in 30 counties of the 67. And 2014, at the end of the fiscal year, as you can see, we had nearly 4,000 offenders in community corrections in 35 programs representing 45 counties. Just kind of a uh, recap, statistically speaking, uh, the Department of Corrections reimbursed over $8 million to those programs that uh, had a contract with DOC. Inmates that are a prison diversion, i.e. they were, they were going to go to prison, however they were diverted to community corrections, we give them $10 a day for a period of 24 months. And as you can see, uh, the legislature uh, appropriates almost six million DOC. We, we appropriated another three million out of, out of our own budget to pay for those uh, reimbursements. And at year end, we had ne uh, nearly 4,000 serving. 
And then uh, we had uh, almost 2,400 that we were reimbursing. During 2014, we've, uh, the number that were added to community corrections was a little over 3,000, with the majority of those being front-end diversions. That is, they came directly from court to their community corrections program. A small a third, I mean, actually a little more than uh, almost 400, actually came from prison to a community corrections program. Success-wise, if you look at community corrections, 73% of those that were released in 2014 we considered a successful release. Uh, nearly 1,000 uh, were released to probation, um, 750 as EOS, and then uh, of that, the unsuccessful, like 600, were returned to prison for some either a technical violation or committed a new crime. Just uh, since this is a uh, forum here in Tuscaloosa, I want to just give you a little statistics on the program here in Tuscaloosa. At the end of year 2014, they had nearly 500 offenders in their program. And then in 2015, right now, they're averaging uh, about 475 offenders in their program under their supervision. Uh, financially, um, in 2014, we reimbursed them a little over $400,000. And we're expected uh, almost uh, more than four and a quarter, or 475,000 in 2015. We've talked a little bit about uh, Senate Bill 67, and Senate Bill 67 has a lot to do with community corrections. And I just wanted to like go over some of the, the big items that apply to community corrections. It's uh, certainly not uh, drilling down on any particular area, but one of the biggest things about uh, Senate Bill 67 is the incorporation of uh, evidence-based practices. That is, proven, uh, tech, proven technologies, proven uh, services, things of that nature that have a predicted outcome that could help offenders and hopefully reduce the number of recidivists because we're actually addressing their, their needs as opposed to not addressing their needs. We're also going to incentivize uh, the use of evidence-based practices throughout the state. So like here in, in uh, Tuscaloosa Community Corrections, the more they used evidence-based practices, the more we would hire, they would have a higher reimbursement rate. Th to determine uh, offenders' level of supervision and uh, their level, their treatment needs, community corrections for the last several years have used the uh, Ohio uh, uh, University's risk and needs assessment. It's a validated tool. The Senate Bill 67 mandates it for all community corrections and all and uh, probation and parolees as well. That really, uh, I think it, 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 when you look at uh, offenders in the community, you use this risk and needs assessment, you determine what his supervision, what his risk is to reoffend within the community and you can adjust the supervision level based on that risk as well as the needs that you can address, and I won't go into much more detail than that. Uh, some of the other things is uh, Senate Bill 67 adds a Class D felony offender, and those, for the most part, will all be going to community corrections. Uh, it'll provide greater options for counties that don't have a program as far as like serving meeting the needs and services offenders, and the governor's office will specifically get involved in. Um, oversight and guidance, funding, financial guidance. It's, we're primarily talking about trying to meet the, the physical, mental health, and mental, medical needs of offenders in the communities. I know that was uh, really rushed, but if uh, anybody has any other questions? Yes, sir. If I could just make an observation. Uh, the way the court system uses community corrections is not only what you've just been talking about, <laughs> diverting somebody from prison to community corrections, but it's also for pretrial supervision. Um, I, I don't know exactly what our numbers are, uh, but um, a, a lot of the situations, Chief, that you've seen and, and uh, that you've seen also, uh, some, a lot of them may be serving a sentence there, but a lot of them may be on uh, pretrial supervision. Uh, we've got to have community corrections in, in, Tus in Tuscaloosa because otherwise we would not have a, vi a valid pretrial supervision uh, while that person is waiting to go to trial. Uh, and if they do something to mess up, we revoke their bond and then we stick them in, we stick them in jail. We also use community corrections to supervise people on probation because the probation office is so, is so over, overwhelmed with the numbers that they, that they have used. Um, I, I have visited Shelby County's community corrections and in many ways I think they are the, 
flagship because they have their own uh, lockdown facility, a, a work release facility. And uh, I think all of us would agree that if we could have something like that, uh, where we could have more intensive supervision on community corrections, uh, that would be wonderful. Is that work release facility a state facility? It I is. It's a county facility, to my knowledge. I think it's private. You think it's private? I do. It may be their, their, their... It's a private contract through the county. Okay. You make a good point, sir. Uh, since each program is a county-run program, each community corrections program, it can be either a county program, it can be a, a public authority run by the county with a separate board. In many counties, they're a nonprofit 501c3. Um, and each of those counties, they have many, many functions. I mean, there's uh, some counties that have... They do the CRO, they do the drug court, they do the veterans court, they, they, they do pretrial divorce, the they do pretrial diversion, and as you say, in many cases, they, uh, they do the drug testing for everybody in the county. Not only that, um, it just, I think you know well, Judge, that uh, community corrections to be effective, it has to have all the stakeholders involved, and it requires a, a collaboration of all those stakeholders within the county. The use of the uh, ARAS, the Alabama Risk and Needs Assessment uh, System, that is mandated for all community corrections programs to use. I, I believe the screening process is a problem. Uh, we deal with a number of people and, that are in community corrections and that are still in the community committing crime. I mean, and, and that's just a fact of life. Um, and so maybe we need to reevaluate the screening tool that we're using and, and see if we can do a better job of of placement with people in community corrections. Well, one issue is is not necessarily the screening tool. It is the presumptive sentencing guidelines that tell me I cannot send that person to prison. I don't want to put them on probation because that's they're, they're overwhelmed. What's my what's my what's my option? Mm -hmm. Community corrections. And normally the uh, the screening tool is not used until they show up at their at their doorstep. So at, at in Alabama, the, there's not a risk and needs assessment that starts at arrest, which it, the, the Ohio risk tool, you, you can use it through, through the whole uh, litany of, of the criminal justice system. And, and let me point out, my probation officers tell me that it takes, about, it takes them about an hour to go through the risk and needs assessment with their individual. And, and they've got enormous You're correct. I, I've done, I've done the, uh, use the tool on offenders, and it, it is time uh, consuming. Yes, sir. Well, one point that you that you make, for instance, if I'm in a probation docket, I have somebody who, or a revocation docket, somebody who tests positive for drugs. I ask my probation officer to take them into custody immediately, and they and they can do that because they're APOS certified. I always have community corrections in court with me as well. They can't do that. They have no arrest powers, uh, and and that is a problem. That varies by county. Some counties they they are APOS certified. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, Mobile County is a good example. All of their officers are uh, APOS certified. I think, uh, I think that would be a wonderful thing to have. Again, on behalf of our city council, I want to thank you for you know, giving us seven hours of your day. Um, and I look forward to uh, meeting with you again probably sometime in August and September and doing something great in, in the months and years ahead. Have a great day. Thank you.